As you're being seated, um, I'm uh, very excited to continue our series that we started uh, just last week, and we simply are, have called it freedom. One word, freedom. We put a little exclamation point at the end there just to, uh, to, to uh, let the world know how we feel about that freedom. And uh, it's such an important um, topic through the ages. It's a really important topic in times uh, because of, I think there's certain times in history when it seems like bondage is more uh, prevalent, or at least maybe we see it in, in more of a prevalent way. And so when we look at freedom today, uh, we're going to sort of continue our theme from last week and just touch on that, use that as a springboard uh, as we uh, get into this theme today. And we'll be several weeks uh, in this theme. And the message today is simply this, walking in freedom, walking in freedom. Now, um, we're going to look at different scriptures. We'll be a lot, though, in Luke chapter 4 and John chapter 8, and I'll direct you uh, to those locations at the appropriate time. But when people lose their freedom, um, you, you know, they, maybe they're placed in jail or prison. They lose their freedom uh, in society uh, because of their actions. Um, how does that affect a person? When they're, when they're uh, put in jail or they're in prison, they've lost their physical freedom, how does that affect them? Well, um, the, the fact is, <coughs> it's, it's common things. It's, it's obvious things. It keeps them from connecting with people they love, right? Uh, that connection uh, isn't the same. It's, it's more verbal. It's less personal. Um, it, it, uh, co- it keeps them from uh, maybe um, not only connecting with people they love, but it keeps them from... Uh, accomplishing some goals that they have in life. Maybe, maybe uh, certainly, most likely, it, it sidelines their career and some of their purpose. It, it uh, causes them to miss out on celebrations of, of the family and important events in the family. In other words, when we lose our freedom and we're put, we lose our liberty and we lose our physical freedom, it affects our relationships around us and it keeps us from realizing our dreams and life goals. Well, we're not talking about being incarcerated today. We're talking about not physical bondage, but we're going to talk about spiritual bondage. You see, being physically in jail is one thing, but being uh, spiritually or emotionally in bondage carries with it some of the same consequences. For instance, uh, there are a lot of people that are walking around free, but if you were to talk with them in a moment of honesty, they would say, I feel like I'm in bondage. Now, why is that? Why have, maybe we have felt that way at times in our life. Um, They are free, but they are walking around in bondage and the, the results are similar. Because they're in a spiritual, emotional bondage, the, the relationships, they can't connect with the people that they love. Um, uh, in, uh, ca- you know, in, in, in other cases, they're just not living the life that God intended them to live. <clears throat> and so for us to study freedom, first of all, we have to understand what bondage is, right? So if, we, <clears throat> if we're in bondage and we know that God wants us to enjoy freedom and liberty, because that's a theme certainly throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament and very much in the gospel and very much in the words of Jesus Christ, let's start by understanding what bondage is. Um, there are a lot of people who believe that liberty and freedom comes from certain things. And I think this would be indicative of our culture. Someone might say, you know, if I just had, if I had uh, enough money to do everything that I wanted to do, man, I would have some freedom in life. Uh, If I uh, had the authority to, to direct people around me instead of just being in the position that I am, but if I had power and I had some authority and I could direct people to do what I want them to do, I feel like I would have liberty and I think I'd have some freedom in my life. And, and uh, if I um, had enough uh, influence where, uh, you, you know, where I could just get the things accomplished that I want to be accomplished, I had enough money and I could get anything I wanted, people would do anything that I need them to do or ask them to do or wanted them to do. I could just be free. But the truth is, if we pause just for a moment, we know that's not true. 
Because it's oftentimes that the freedom and liberty and those, uh, those trappings, if you will, that do put people in bondage. You know, if we, we can see that even in our culture, and I won't name some names, but we could look at some people that uh, of notoriety or people of fame, whether it's in Hollywood or entertainment or politics, we can look at people and say, boy, they seem to have it made. They have all the money they want. They have power and authority, and people have to do what they want. And uh, if we were to do that and to consider that, we, would, we could look at lives and we could name them one after one, uh, the lives of people that that didn't lead to freedom. It actually led to bondage. They gave up their liberty. Um, I think the, a great example is one we touched on last week, right? The richest man, maybe who's ever lived, comparatively speaking, in his time, he perhaps had uh, a vast wealth that outdistanced distances all the wealth on the earth if you put it together and said this man this was his wealth he may have been the wealthiest man who's ever lived and that's Solomon Solomon had all the money he could possibly want and need he had all the power because he was influential Uh, he had all the fame because people came from all over the world leaders powerful leaders came to see him And yet, you know where all that led, all that he had, and we've studied his life before, you know where all that led? Well, I don't need to tell you, I'll just tell you what he said. With all of that, wow, he must have had incredible freedom. No, here are his own words. I hated life. He didn't have the liberty that he thought he would have. And if those things don't actually lead to liberty, they lead to a bondage, then what is it in our life that would give us true liberty and freedom? Well, um, we have to look at it and, and say, what is the answer? And, and how do I understand bondage if the things that I think would bring me freedom actually would lead to more bondage? Well, let's use one word, okay? Uh, and we're all familiar with this word. Let's just use the word cravings to start out here, all right? So we have these cravings in our life, all right? Um, We've talked about the flesh, Romans 6 and Romans 7, and the apostle Paul uh, said, you know, the things that I would, you know, I wanted to do, I don't do those, and the things I'm trying not to do, I find myself doing them, and he explains that it's because even though you, you may be saved, if you trusted Christ as your personal savior, you have a new spirit, a new nature in you, and you have the Holy Spirit living in you. But Paul said, you know, we're not going to get rid of this flesh until Jesus comes back. And so think about this. Think about the fact that um, when we look at uh, that flesh, it has these cravings. Now, let's break those into two categories, okay? All right? So if we have cravings, some of the cravings that we have, they are, uh, they're, they're from the soul. And some of the craving, cravings we have are from the body. So, you know, the cravings of the body, um, probably all of us will eat today. Why? Because we will get hungry. We have these cravings. It's God put that in us. If we don't eat, we don't survive. And so we have this desire to eat. We have a desire to rest. We have a desire, uh, humanly speaking, for sex. We have a desire, um, uh, you you know, for food and water and, and pleasure. And these are physical cravings that every person deals with and has. But there's also cravings of the soul. Uh, In cravings of the soil, God uh, has put it in us and we have a desire for community. People want to be accepted. And I don't care, you give me the the hermit, you know, the the most well-known hermit who's ever lived. And I go, inside of that person, somewhere at some time, there was a desire for him to live or her to live in community. God's given us that craving, um, safety, identity, purpose in our life, uh, freedom, acceptance. These are things that are cravings of the soul. And so what happens with those cravings of the soul is the Bible teaches us that uh, the fall of man, our sin, our sinful flesh and the fall of man has distorted some good things, some natural cravings that we have. 
So these things that are craving of the body, are there's nothing wrong with them. It's not, it's not wrong for us to crave food. But can't, we can abuse that, can't we? Um, it's not wrong for us to crave sex, but with, outside of God's plan, it's, it's wrong. Um, it, it's not uh, bad for us to you know, crave pleasure, but that gets out of balance in our life. And all those things, when taken out of balance, they don't lead to freedom like Solomon thought they would because he had, he had all of that and he wanted all of that and he got all of that. And at the end, he said, I just hated life. I was in despair because those things outside of God, God's plan bring us into bondage. Now, we're not gonna touch, we're gonna just touch on that today. In coming weeks, we're gonna really ratchet down on some of those things and, and addictions and things because let me tell you this, and I mentioned it last week, sometimes the very things that we try to avoid are the very things that God uses to bring us into liberty. And they're very, they can be uncomfortable. And sometimes that's confrontation uh, in our lives about uh, something that has happened or an addiction. And it's very uncomfortable and people are defensive. And God might be using that in our lives to not make us uncomfortable, but to let us be uncomfortable so that he can make us holy and so that we can have liberty in our lives. Okay, so we're gonna touch on that. Just put that in the back of your mind. We're gonna touch on that in the next few weeks. So there are many people, though we know, <coughs> that um, have these cravings. So, so, so since sin has distorted these cravings, in our lives, let me break that down into three, three separate categories, okay? So here are things that would destroy us and put us in bondage. And, and these uh, emanate from cravings, desires that we have, and they're taken out of God, God's context. And let's, let's list three of them. Um, we crave power. We crave uh, instant gratification. I mean, doesn't that describe our culture today? We don't want anything to take a long time. So the third one is shortcuts. So someone who goes like, yeah, I'd like to have wealth. Instead of working for it, they go like, you know, I think I'll just spend my life taking other people's wealth, you know? And how many of you get these emails and you go, how do people follow this? And it goes, I have a cousin in Nigeria. I have a cousin in, uh, you know, Uzbekistan. And I was left $5.1 million. Call me and you can have half of it. You know, how many of you, do you still get those emails? Do you guys get those emails? How many of you get those emails? You don't get those? A year. <laughs> it's been a while. Man, something's wrong with me because they're still coming after me for my, for, for my money. Uh, uh, and, they, or they, and, and you know how they use that. And it's, they, they want to get your number and they want to take what's yours. And so some people go like, yeah, I'm, I have this craving and I want to meet these needs, but I want to get wealthy and I'm just going to take a shortcut, you know, and it leads to bondage. And so, uh, and by the way, that's the same way with, with sex. Someone says, well, uh, you know, God says, wait. And in this context, it's good and healthy, right? And, and what happens? Um, we like to take shortcuts, instant gratification and power uh, and uh, shortcuts in life. And so there are a lot of people then who believe that God's moral laws actually put us in bondage. <laughs> you mean you can't do this? You can't do that? You can't do the other thing? You know, we're, we're, we are we're Baptist church with Baptist doctrine. And uh, when I tell people, um, yeah, we're Baptist church, you know, um, they get this idea in their mind. Oh, we know, we know what that's like. So all your, all your services on Sunday as you preach are about don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do this, and here's the list of things you can't do. And I say, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Just every Sunday we go like, here's the list, don't do these things, bad. Uh, we don't do that. But that's what people think about. They think that, that Christianity, they think that the Bible puts people in bondage. And you've met people like that. And you've talked to people like that. I've talked to people like that. But that couldn't be further from the truth. The only reason that people believe that is because of the fact that, because uh, of the fact that um, uh, the, the, the devil is the deceiver. And we're going we're gonna to take a look at that. The devil's the deceiver. And he gives us a lie. And he tries to deceive people into believing what's not true is true. And what's 
uh, you, you know, what, what, you know, the reverse. So he says, this is true. We're going to try to make people believe that's untrue. And, and um, uh, this is not true. And we're going to try to make people believe that that's true because he's a deceiver and his intention, it's not God who wants to put us in bondage. It's Satan himself. He wants people to be in bondage. God and God's laws offer us freedom. I, I, I love this verse. David wrote, Psalm 119, verse 45, and I will walk at liberty, why? For I seek thy precepts. David said, you know, God, I'm looking for your word. I'm looking for your your truth, your moral, uh, you know, fill in anything, uh, God's moral laws, uh, God's truth, God's precepts, and he says, you know, when I get that down, I have true liberty. And the world doesn't really believe that. At all. It's not God trying to put man into bondage. It's Satan, the natural man, the unsaved man, the unregenerate man is in bondage. And by the way, that was every person that saved at one time walked in bondage. Because the natural person is in bondage until Jesus Christ sets them free. All right, so um, according to Paul, here's one commentary <clears throat> that I that I read and wrote down some thoughts from it. According to Paul, there are two sources of cravings in the life of a believer. There are the cravings that are produced by our flesh and the cravings that are produced by the Holy Spirit. Anyone who's ever tried to live for the Lord knows that there is still something inside of them that has an appetite for sin. Often Christians ask, why can't I get rid of these thoughts? And why do they keep coming into my mind? And why is it that it seems that I almost at times desire to have them? Part of me wants to say, go away, and another part of me says, no, stay. Why do I have this constant struggle? And the reason that we have this constant struggle with sin is because something inside of us keeps telling us that sin will somehow make us happy, and, and that sin somehow will be give us free, make us free and give us freedom. And so, hey, if I want a lot of sexual partners and I, and I have that, man, I'm gonna enjoy freedom. If I, if I, uh, if I desire this thing, if I uh, desire uh, these relationships and these intimate relationships, if I uh, desire wealth and I put, and I love it and I put all my effort into it, that just leads to bondage is what scripture tells us. And so if you feel trapped spiritually and emotionally, um, you don't have liberty and you're not, listen, here's, here's an important part. You're not the person God has created you to be. Who did God create us to be? People who bring him glory. And so my life, your life, all of our lives are to bring God glory. And when we're in liberty, he does not receive the glory that he deserves. And so um, what causes us these feelings of entrap- uh, in- entrapment or bondage. Uh, I'll say one thing right off the beginning here. Um, one thing that leads us into bondage is the feeling that, uh, or the reality that we're trying to live by other people's expectations. Um, the, the truth is that we are to follow the Holy Spirit and not what every person in our life wants. Now, I'm going to give you a caveat there and a, and a disclaimer in just a moment, but take that at face value. The fact is that um, when we uh, are letting everybody around us dictate our lives and our values and our morals and our actions and our time, they're controlling us and not the Holy Spirit. And God says I, 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 the Holy Spirit should be controlling us. So we have to be very careful about that because if we don't, it puts us in It puts us in bondage. Um, Last week, I I mentioned this. Psychologists call that our false self. False self. Um, And um, false self puts us in bondage. It's it's living a lie to please everyone around you. Not because uh, you think that's the best thing, but because you want to fit in. And so that desire for community gets out of whack. And we say, listen, I'm going to let... I'm going to let others control me in what I do and what I think and how I spend my time and my priorities. And someone who lives like that is someone whose liberty is gone and they're in bondage and maybe they don't even realize that they're in bondage. And so living your life to please those around you, number one, it doesn't help you uh, because it puts you in bondage to the whim of whoever happens to be trying to manipulate you at the time. 
And then uh, it doesn't help the person. You say, well, I'm doing it because I, I really want to make them love, feel loved and accepted. And that d- it doesn't help them when they manipulate you because all that does is cause them to be bigger manipulators. It causes them to be in control of someone or something that God never intended for them to be in control of. And so I'm not talking, here's my disclaimer. I'm not talking about um, living a selfish, hedonistic lifestyle that says, I don't care what anybody thinks, this is what I'm doing. That's not it at all. We're not talking about, <clears throat> because by the way, don't forget, uh, if someone else is controlling us or we're controlling ourselves, both of those lead to what? Bondage. It's the Holy Spirit that's supposed to, be, to lead the life of a believer. It's the Holy Spirit that's supposed to direct us. And so uh, <clears throat> it was the, the only way that helps us in that, if that's the area of bondage in someone's life, the only thing that helps us is God's plan. You know what God's plan is? This is beautiful. It's simple. You've heard it. He said, love God and love others. When that is our motto, when that is our reality, there is liberty and we are fulfilling what we should be. Not in perfection because we still live in this flesh, but you love God, you set your affection on things of him. Uh, you, put, you set your affection on him and things above as Paul told the Colossians. And that puts you on a path to pleasing God and living a flourishing life, a life of freedom and liberty. Then you love others. Because we can't love God, we can't love others the way we should if we're not loving God the way that we should. Because it's God that teaches us to love others correctly. <clears throat> I was talking with someone this week. This might sound familiar to you. Um, uh, you know, he said, um, you know, I, I just, I want God to have his way and I don't, I don't want to have vengeance towards someone that had done, done him wrong. And I said, that's, that's what all of us, how, do, how we want to respond Someone does me wrong, guess what? My first thought, if I'm not careful, my flesh's first thought is, I can get that person back. <laughs> let, me, let me get them back. Let me, let me have some vengeance. And God goes, Ray, you, I can't trust you with vengeance. I can't trust you with meeting out justice because you have an imperfect justice. What you think is justice, Ray, is so often not justice, so leave that to me. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And so uh, that, that, those things put us in bondage. So loving others, uh, loving God. So if we love others, if, if we love God as we should, then that gives us the ability to love others selflessly and truly be their friend and their support. Now, there's an amazing Bible example here of, we're talking about cravings, and we're talking about all these things that have to do with with instant gratification and power uh, and and taking shortcuts in life, and we're going to address those over the next few weeks. Um, There's an amazing passage on this. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus, it gives us this amazing story, Jesus is being tempted. Do you remember this story? And so Jesus is is being tempted by by Satan. And um, what happens is that Jesus has been fasting for 40 days, and so he's hungry. Now, now Satan comes to tempt Jesus. Now, let me very quickly tell you what that's all about. Because we touched on this about, well, probably about five or six weeks ago. And, and it's something doctrinally that we all ought to understand. So Satan comes to tempt Jesus. And you say, why? Did he really think he was going to get Jesus to, to fall to this temptation? He was trying everything that he could. Why was he trying to tempt Jesus? For one reason. Remember that we talked about how in the Garden of Eden, what was it about Satan coming down as one of God's beautiful creatures? Uh, the snake was very different than we see today. There was, of course, no fear. And so... You know, we see beauty in snakes today. I know they may not be your favorite creature, uh, but the fact is they're incredibly colorful. They went through a curse and they were very different uh, in God's original design and creation than they are today. So Satan comes down in the form of a beautiful creature and his intention was to get Adam 
to sin because if he could get Adam to sin, he could control what God had given Adam to control. Very quickly, without going back to those verses, we covered this a few weeks ago. What did God give Adam to control? This world. He put him in the garden. He said, you have dominion. Uh, You till the soil. What did God do? God didn't name the creatures. Have you ever thought about that? What did he do? He said, Adam, you're going to name them. Why? Because you're in control. I'm giving you this. And the way you take care of this will glorify my name. And it did. And by the way, that's what our work is supposed to do. It's supposed to glorify God. All that we do is supposed to glorify God. How we go to work, how we treat our coworkers, how we handle our responsibilities. And so here's Adam, and he's doing what God told him to do, having dominion. Here comes Satan and goes, hey, let me mess with God's dominion in your life. God gave you dominion, but he said, don't eat of that tree. But you know what? That tree, look at it. It's beautiful. Why don't you go touch it? You know, he's talking to Eve, and well, you know the rest of the story. Eve eats. Adam eats, and they lose kingdom, dominion, dominion on this earth, and Satan legally takes that from them. Satan legally is in control of this world. That's why, that's why it is the way that it is. He's not a mythical creature. He's not some, um, well, you know, talking snake. Yeah, right, there's Satan. That's, you know, Hollywood and the world culture, they, they, they would dismiss that and laugh at that and You just do that at your own peril. So Satan has control of this world. But you know what? Satan knows his time is limited, and we looked at some scripture that tells us that. And so Satan um, saw an opportunity because Jesus came down in the flesh. He came down as God and man, right? He was truly God, truly man. But now, of all of the history of time is Satan's opportunity because Jesus has robed himself in flesh, and if there was ever a time that Satan could do the same thing to Jesus that he did to Adam, it's now while Jesus is in the flesh. Maybe he's gonna expose a weakness because Jesus gets tired, Jesus gets hungry, Jesus has uh, these, these uh, uh, the, the, you know, the same cravings of the flesh that we have, yet he didn't sin one time. The Bible says that he, um, you, you know, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So he'd get hungry, but he was never a glutton. Um, he would have desires that we have, but they never out of balance because he was the perfect son of man. So Satan comes and says, let me do. Adam, I, I deceived. Maybe this is my moment. There's an opportunity, and he tempts Jesus. If he can get Jesus to to fall, he has control. He knows that one day that's gonna end, but he tries to take advantage of this opportunity. And Jesus is uh, in the wilderness. He fasts 40 days. And what's the first thing that Satan does? He says, um, he comes to Jesus and he said, "Um, hey, look at those stones there. And and I'm sure they were, you know, these rounded stones that look like bread. And he goes, uh, you know, if you're hung, if you haven't eaten for 40 days, you're hungry. And I imagine, you know, uh, that was quite a temptation. He goes, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Just do what I tell you to do. And and um, that was his instant gratification. Don't wait. Do these. Use your power in a way that God did not intend, and turn those stones to bread. And uh, give up your humanity in this moment uh, for these things, for some, for, for some desires, for instant gratification. Jesus, what did he do? He quotes scripture to him and says no. Then what, is, what does Satan do? Satan takes him up into a mountain. And uh, he, uh, in a moment, the Bible says in a moment. So Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world, past and present. This was an amazing scene in the Bible. We don't know all that took place, but he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world, past and present, in that moment of time. And um, he said, um, hey, listen, but, but, by the way, we, now, now, we are, now it's backed up with another scripture. Satan says, uh, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all of these. Why? Why could he do that? Because they belong to him. He won them. Now he's tempting Jesus. And what does the Bible call Jesus? The second Adam. The first Adam fell. Now the second Adam, will he fall? And he tempts him and says, I'll give you all of this. Just 
bow down and worship me and all this is yours because I own it legally. Maybe in a moment of weakness as Jesus is flesh, he'll fall and Satan will gain control. But Jesus says no and quotes some more scripture. He's not fallen. He is Jesus without sin. And then lastly, Satan's last attempt, he offers him three deals. The third deal is this. He takes him to Jerusalem, takes him to the top part of the temple, and it was the largest building there, and it was one of the most amazing edifices in the ancient world. This temple, it's beautiful. There's a tall pinnacle, and he takes Jesus there. It's crowded. There are people everywhere on this, uh, in this temple. Even today, the Temple Mount is a hub of activity, and it certainly was a hub of activity back then. And Satan says, um, here's your deal. If you will just throw your, why don't you just throw yourself down? You know what's going to happen, Jesus. The angels will catch you. Everybody here will see it and they'll say, wow, wow, who is this man? And they will think that you're something important and something big and you'll receive glory. And um, he has offered him instant gratification in the bread. He's offered him power in the, in the kingdoms of the world, and now he offers him a shortcut because Jesus didn't need to take a shortcut to the glory that God intended to give to him. Um, that's already promised him, and he says no to this shortcut, and he says no to Satan, quotes scripture, and the temptation is done. And thank God, Jesus is without sin, and that's the reason that only Jesus can save us. That's why no other religion <clears throat> makes sense or can make sense or can save me or can save you. It's because Jesus came to this earth in the flesh. He came as God. He came as man. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And so today and <clears throat> over the next few weeks, we're going to explore those three Cravings that the, the power, the instant gratification, uh, that desire for uh, shortcuts, that's what our flesh wants and it puts us in bondage. And so this, this for today, let's spend the last uh, to, mo moments that we have today together to think about this really important question and we've touched on it, but let's explore it. What is bondage? Because we have to answer that biblically. What is bondage? Well, since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, mankind has longed for liberty from bondage. Sin has put mankind into bondage, and Jesus came to us with a plan to set mankind free. Adam and Eve sin. Jesus comes and he goes, okay, you guys are in bondage. I told you it would happen, but I've got a plan and it'll offer you liberty and freedom. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, Genesis 3. And he goes like, here's my plan. And he unveils the gospel in that moment. He didn't wait for a week. Yeah, let me let you stew. Uh, to show God's love and concern, his grace, his, his mercy, immediately he didn't go, I'm gonna, just let you, I'm gonna let you feel the way you feel. Can you imagine? They've never felt this way before. All of a sudden they're in the garden and... Um, I don't know how, how it went down, but um, this lion, oh, look at that cute lion. All of a sudden, the lion's looking at them with hunger in his eyes. Um, uh, oh, look at that beautiful flower. And maybe they went up to touch it, and they go, oh, oh it has a thorn. It's, 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 it's totally disrupted God's beautiful earth and his creation that was perfect, and now it's not perfect. And I imagine... Um, you know, they, their conversations. All of a sudden, um, he looks at Eve and there's some jealousy in his heart for some reason. There's, there's anger, there's, there's vengeance. If you hadn't, and he probably does, isn't voicing it out loud, but in his heart, something he's never felt before. He has vengeance toward Eve. It's your fault. You did this and there's anger and hatred. And can you imagine how they felt? All, and now, um, God doesn't go, yeah, let me let you stew for a while. He immediately comes and goes, I got a plan. You blew it. But in his mercy, he unveils this beautiful plan that we see. That's the story of the Bible. That's what the story of the Old Testament, all of it, or in the New Testament, all points to the focal point of history. Jesus coming 
being born of a virgin, dying on the cross, rising again. So what is bondage? Well, It happened at the fall in Romans 8. I love Romans 8. Romans 8 verses 19 through 21, it simply tells us this. It tells us that all of creation right now is groaning. It's waiting for the day when it will be set free and it will be at liberty. Here's how it put, because the creation itself, uh, the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. It says, because the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And one day we know from scripture, this will all be restored back to the original splendor and glory and perfection and beauty that God created. Until now, all of creation is groaning. So we have earthquakes, we have famines, we have floods, we have hurricanes, we have tornadoes. What's that all about? It's all of creation groaning, going, We're waiting for you to come back, Lord. We're waiting for you to come back, God. We're waiting to be restored. All of creation is in bondage, the Bible tells us, and it's because of sin. Um, We we talked about this. Let me just touch uh, on it. A few weeks ago, we talked about how the Bible, uh, there's an incredible scene that takes place in heaven. And and I believe uh, from Scripture uh, that the return of Christ is imminent, and I believe that uh, he comes, he takes uh, the church, uh, he raptures the church, he raptures all believers, uh, and then uh, when, when, uh, uh, while, while there's a celebration in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb, this earth uh, is... Uh, going through a tribulation period, three and a half years of peace, and then after three and a half years, um, there's a, a, a truce in Jerusalem that is broken. The Antichrist is revealed, and there's pandemonium on this earth. And, um, and the Bible says that that's true in part because Satan knows that his time is short. Revelation 12 tells us that. And, uh, and, and so in Revelation, it tells us that the scene in heaven, uh, as Jesus, as God has this plan and Satan has revolted against him, but God's got that under control. What's your shirt say? God got me. <laughs> God's got it. In sovereignty, nothing should cause us to lose sleep. I, I get it that we do because we're, we're human and we're in flesh. But God's got this in the scenes in heaven. There's celebration going on. And here's what the Bible says. The seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Whose are they now? Satan's. God created it perfect. Satan won it legally from mankind who he got to sin. And got in one day, guess what? God's going to restore his kingdom and he's taking control and he's going to defeat Satan and uh, he's going to lock him up and then there'll be a a incredible peace on this earth and then after that thousand years in Jesus, God gets a final victory. But listen to what this says. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Celebration going on is what I picture and all of a sudden an angel comes in and goes, hey, I got an announcement. News break. News flash. The kingdoms on earth, the kingdoms of earth are become God. And then imagine there's a shout and celebration that goes on. And notice what it says, and he shall reign forever and ever. And there's a great Handel's Messiah that was written in part celebrating that scene in heaven. And so the world's waiting for it, uh, uh, that time when it'll be set at uh, free from bondage. So what caused that bondage is simply sin and the fall of mankind. So how do we obtain freedom? How do we obtain freedom? Well, the Bible says that truth sets us free. Would you, would you find John chapter 8 uh, for me? And let's look there together. John chapter 8. So Jesus said that the truth sets us free. And uh, there's a, this amazing passage of Scripture in John chapter 8. And I'm going to read from verses 31 down through verse 37. So uh, you're maybe still finding that. And I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm going to read several verses. So... Uh, Feel free to continue um, finding that as I read this. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So these are people that believed on him. But there was something about their belief that, that wasn't solidified yet. Think about this. Verse 33. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. 
and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. So verse 32, uh, notice he says, the truth shall make you free. What truth is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about spiritual truth, eternal truth, um, salvation truth. Um, Ephesians chapter four, Paul says this, trust is in Jesus. And so the only place that we're going to find liberty, uh, truth is in Jesus. I said trust, I meant truth is in Jesus. The only place we're gonna find truth is in Jesus. The only place we find eternal truth is in Jesus. Um, and, and if you don't look for Jesus or to Jesus for the truth, you're not gonna find truth. You're gonna miss the truth because you won't have the truth that sets you free. Jesus is the truth, and he said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, uh, so Jesus is the truth. Uh, John 16, the Holy Spirit is the source of truth. Jesus said, I'm gonna send the spirit of truth who will teach you about me. John 17, scripture is truth. So what we know is the word is truth. Uh, Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit is the truth. The scripture is truth. And all that truth points us to, to God, to the God of all truth. And so the problem here, truth sets us free, but the problem is that truth is challenged. Truth is suppressed. And we see that in our culture today. There are some people who are afraid of the truth, and, and, and certainly <clears throat> one of the interesting things here is that Jesus is talking about spiritual truth, and to prove and to show us that truth is suppressed, even in Jesus' time, even uh, people who are exposed to it, like these people who had to some degree, the Bible says that they, they believed him. They believed some things he was saying. They saw his miracles. They had a proclivity to go... He's different, and this man, uh, he's saying true things. Uh, but in verse 45 of John 8, you can look there. He said, because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. Because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. He said, if I'm speaking the truth, why don't you believe me? This is Jesus talking. He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you don't hear them because you're not of God. Pfft, that's a strong words. These are people who said, we're starting to believe in you. And there was pushback about this truth issue. And Jesus said, um, if you concentrated on God, if you're his child, if you wanted this truth, you would hear this truth. You would know this truth. And only the people of God can hear and believe the truth. And uh, outside of that, it's suppressed. And that's the challenge that we that we face. Don't let that discourage you. Truth is it was suppressed then. It's going to be suppressed today. But let's still speak, continue studying the truth, learning the truth, speaking the truth, and speaking the truth. You have children in the home? Speak the truth to them. You have an influence over children? Speak the truth over them. At work? Speak the truth as much as God allows you in your neighborhood, in your community. Let's be people of the truth and people of the book and speak the truth. And what was the context of this? Well, you remember back in Matthew chapter 11. Now, don't lose me here. I want to, I'm going to go through this quickly, but it's really, really important. Back in Matthew chapter 11, you may remember um, that uh, Jesus um, was what was talking to the Pharisees about this religious system that they were in. Um, it was a religious legalistic system. And um, Jesus characterized that system in an unforgettable way. He said, come to me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Why? Because they were in bondage and bondage uh, is, is wearisome. They were weary from what? From the religious legalism that was part of their society. He said, take my yoke upon you. Why? Because I'm gentle and humble in heart. My, you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And so he offers them freedom. He offers them liberty. Uh, and, and the religious leaders had put a burden on these people. Uh, that, and, and he said, you can't carry it uh, on your own. You can't bear this. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a burden that you can't bury. And he describes the leaders uh, you can't bury and, and, and bear it. And in, in Matthew chapter 23, he describes these leaders uh, as people. You put burdens on the people and they can't carry it. And by the way, you can't carry it yourself. And so he was attacking these religious leaders. So here's what he says in Matthew 23. 
Feel the weight of this. This is why Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. Because at the name of Jesus, it's a name that causes division even today. Let me tell you what Jesus said in Matthew, uh, in Matthew 23. He said, you, speaking of the religious leaders, produce children of hell. I read, you know, and, and I pray for people. I read about Elon Musk uh, in, in, in interviews in the last couple of years of his life, and he said, you know what? He said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a cultural Christian because I believe in the message of love that Jesus spoke. Well, Jesus didn't just speak of love. He spoke truth, and that truth is sometimes hard to hear. Can you imagine that, Joe? You're children of hell. Can you imagine that? That's a strong word. Those are, those are fighting words. <laughs> you know? uh, and here's Jesus. Too. Why? Because they wouldn't admit that. And here at the end of Matthew, he's trying to trying to get them to understand that. And by the way, some did understand that, and some did believe, and some did admit that. But why did Jesus say that? Um, uh, You know, he he said back in John 8, now we're back in John 8, and they said, um, you know, we're we're children of Moses. We've, We've never been enslaved to any man. And you say, well, weren't they enslaved to... Uh, Babylon and to the Greeks in part and currently the Romans and the Medo-Persians. Yeah, they were, but they weren't talking about the physical freedom. They were talking about spiritual freedom. And here's what they were saying. They were saying, we're children of Abraham. We're God's favorite. We have liberty. We're going to heaven because of our religious identification. It's exactly what they were saying to him. What are you talking about? We're Abraham's seed. And um, Jesus uh, was exposing them because they didn't realize that they were in bondage, but they were. They didn't realize they were lost, but they were. And Jesus' heart of love told them some hard things to get them to realize that you don't even know that you're in bondage, but you're in bondage. And so... They answer him, we're Abraham's descendant. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we'll become free? They didn't know that they were lost. And Jesus describes them this way. I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. And that's why, Robert, we sing a lot of songs that say this. I am who you say I am. Because it takes humility to say to God, your word says that I'm a sinner, that I'm fallen, that I'm broken. And that's exactly who I am. And it takes that humility. And these people that Jesus were talking to were saying, that's not us. <laughs> you got the wrong people. Go to the, go to those, uh, go to the harlots and, and uh, you know, go to the tax collector. They need you, not us. And Jesus said, well, I did come to call the, um, I, you know, I, I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, uh, but sinners. And that describes all of us, so they were righteous in their own minds. Now if we go back in our mind to Luke chapter four, there's a really powerful illustration here. Remember that Jesus goes to Nazareth, he's been performing miracles all over Galilee. They're hearing about him back in his hometown, back in Nazareth. They are, um, they're hearing, he, he did this miracle, he turned water to wine, and, and uh, he's healed people, and finally Jesus comes back to his hometown. He's the hometown boy, and they're like, yeah, we heard about you, this is great, we're so glad to have you here, and he goes into to the synagogue, and they, he's a visiting rabbi, so they have, have him read, and he picks up the Bible, and notice what he says, and listen to this message of freedom. He quotes Isaiah 61. They give him the scrolls, and he opens, finds Isaiah 61. He had it memorized by heart, but he wants them to know he's reading from the scroll. He's reading Isaiah 61, and here's the scene in Luke chapter 4. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, And listen to this message of freedom. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is a scripture fulfilled in your ears. 
Wish we had time, more, more time to dissect that, but just understand this. They knew that was a messianic passage, and they knew in that moment he was saying, I'm the Messiah, and I'm finally here, and I'm arri- I've arrived. And I came to set people at liberty. The only problem was they didn't think they were in bondage. So you know what they did? You know, they grabbed him. They took him up to this cliff overlooking this Jezreel Valley. And they were getting ready to throw him off the cliff. He would be dashed to pieces, his body would, in that, on the rocks beneath. And one problem was it just wasn't time. And so he slips through the middle of them and disappears. And they're like, where did, where did he go? They wanted to kill him for one reason. Because he said, I came to offer freedom and you are enslaved and you need that freedom. And they're like, hey, we're, we're God's favorites. We don't need what you're talking about. Go to the publicans. Go some, some, find some sinners, not us. They were righteous in their own conceit. And so they tried to kill Jesus after his first sermon in Nazareth. And they, the same thing happens in John chapter 8 that we were looking at. They say, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. We were never enslaved to anyone. What are you saying that we'll become free? We are free. They see themselves as free. They're not. So what kind of freedom is Jesus offering them? This is so important. What kind of freedom? John 8, 34, Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Couldn't be any clearer. Jesus said, you, you, you are conceited, your religious Conceit has caused you to believe that you're righteous in your own conceit and you're not your sinner like every other person, but they were in religious bondage. And that's the first thing we need to understand on this second day of this series. But Paul said to the church at Galatia, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And so... They're thinking, hey, we're sons of Abraham. We're Abraham's seed. We're the elect covenant people. We are free. We don't need your message. And he said, no, you do because you're sinners. And they were offended by that. And constantly, that was the biggest um, tension between Jesus and the Pharisees was that he said, you need to be liberated. And they said, hey, we're not. We don't need to be liberated because we're not in bondage. Roman centurion came to Jesus, a Gentile. And this is why they hated Jesus. One of the reasons, Roman Gentile comes to Jesus. He's in Capernaum. And uh, this servant says, um, <clears throat> this, this Roman centurion says, hey, I have, a, I have a, um, a servant who's really meaningful to me and gonna die. Will you heal him? And Jesus looks at him and goes, I'll come with you. I'll go with you to heal him. And the centurion so humbly says, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. Just say the word and my servant will be healed and live. Don't even, and, 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 and so Jesus turns to the people and he says, man, what a marvelous faith. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. This was a Roman centurion, a Gentile. He turns to the Jews and says, I'm not seeing faith like that. And uh, Jesus um, uh, you know, Jesus marveled at his faith and uh, he, he says in verse 11, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever wondered what he was talking about there? He's saying, um, this, my kingdom, heaven isn't just for a select group of people uh, that have been, uh, that are my chosen people. I, you're my chosen people because my son, the Messiah, had to be born through you, but you need his salvation as much as everybody needs that salvation. And he was saying to a people that believe, no, we're God's chosen people. We're the ones that are at one with God. And God said, no, this centurion, his faith He has faith in me. He's put his faith in me, and he's a child of God. That's why Paul said to the church at Galatia, he said, in his letter, he said, we're all children of God through what? Faith. They thought we, we are children of God through our birth, and Jesus said, no, that's not what makes a child of God. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And so let's close. Think about this. 
The fall put every one of us in bondage, but Jesus came and said, I offer you liberty, I offer you freedom, and it only comes through Jesus Christ. That's why all of history is, uh, is <clears throat> predicated, all of history is balanced on one event. It's the birth of Jesus, and at that time, all of history started a different numbering system. Why? Because it's the focal point of all of history. And so we say, so we see BC before Christ and AD into dominion, which means after his birth. And so all of history focuses on that. Why? Because that's when he came and he offered us freedom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for offering us freedom. We thank you that we can understand about bondage. We thank you that we can understand that sometimes there are certainly people around us. Maybe it's because of a real religious affiliation. Maybe it's because they are in a situation where they feel they are self-righteous. But all of us have the same problem. We're all fallen. We all are sinful. And the consequences of sin are clear. That we would spend an eternity without Christ in, in a place called hell, but you love us enough to offer us freedom and liberty. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, first of all, to be thankful as we've studied that today, that we would be in humility as we understand what you've offered us, that we'd be grateful because we're all in bondage except that you offered us freedom through faith in Christ and help us to tell others about that Lord because we know people that we love dearly who are in bondage they don't have the liberty they they may fear eternity they might fear death they might uh, fear the the um, this world and in in safety and but yet Lord we know that you've given us liberty and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty and uh, father we pray that if anybody's listening Lord, they don't know you as their personal savior if they place their faith in you. They'd understand true liberty. They'd understand bondage. And uh, Father, thank you for making it so clear in scripture. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.